Church to the Aegean shores. The missionary outreach narrated in this section of the book took place in major cities along the Aegean coastline that major Roman roads connected. We continue from last session with the church's expansion to the other uttermost parts of the earth where Paul and Barnabas had encountered false teachers in Pisidian Antioch demanding the law of Moses be observed by Christians before they can be saved. To prevent further confusion on the matter, a de delegation is sent to the elders in Jerusalem to settle the matter for all. The false teaching is rebuked, and a letter is sent to all the churches reminding them of the teaching of Jesus and the will of the Holy Spirit regarding qualifications of entering the church. Salvation is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. After a dispute between Paul and Barnabas, they choose new disciples to travel with and set out again. Now we have Timothy joining Paul and Silas. Picking up from the end of Acts 15, Barnabas took John Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and this is the last we hear of them. And Paul chose Silas and departed being recommended by the brothers to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches, in other words, building them up in the faith, explaining things to them and carrying on. We also know Silas by his Roman name, Silvanus, because he's mentioned later in scripture around 2 Corinthians. He is a Hellenistic Jew who had been a leader in the Jerusalem church. He is a prophet, a vocal minister in Antioch, a Roman citizen, and an effective scribe. Silas became Paul's primary companion on his second missionary journey. And he goes through Lystra and Derbe. This is, remember, all of this up here, this is all modern day Turkey now. But these are areas that the apostles traveled all through and eventually will wind up over in Greece, just across the Aegean Sea there. Then came Paul to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Tim Timotheus. Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed. Timothy's mother is Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois, are both heartfelt Jews and had, been, and had instructed Timothy in the Hebrew scriptures since he was a little boy. And that's talked about in 2 Timothy. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brothers that were at Lystra and Iconium. The concern with character in those who assume Christian leadership, speaking about Timothy, is a well-documented testimony of the early church and a needful practice that should return. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. In other words, all the people in these areas knew Timothy, knew his dad and his mother, so they knew that his dad was a Greek. But Timothy was born of a Jewish woman, so thereby he is a Jew. Timothy is to become one of Paul's closest friends and most faithful fellow workers. Paul obviously did not circumcise P Timothy because he believed the rite was necessary for justification or sanctification. 
He did so simply because it was necessary for effective evangelistic ministry among the Jews. Because if you're uncircumcised, the Jews aren't even going to listen to you. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees. In other words, the letters that were written by the uh, Jewish elders out of Jerusalem for to keep that were ordained, in other words, judged by the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. Part of Paul's mission includes acquainting the churches in Galatia with the judgments requested from the Jerusalem elders correcting all of the false teachings. And so were the churches established in faith and increased in number daily. So they're still continuing to grow even with all the opposition that's coming against them. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, isn't that something? The Holy Spirit held them up and said, uh-uh, you're not going there. After they were come to Mycenae, they assayed, and assayed here means tested, to go into Bithynia. In other words, they were testing the Spirit. They were checking with the Holy Spirit to see if proceeding was okay but the Spirit suffered them not. He said no. We are not told why the Holy Spirit forbids them in this area, but perhaps the Spirit advises this region was allocated to Peter. As we see in 1 Peter later on, in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, it says, An apostle of Jesus Christ of the stranger scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So in other words, Peter was speaking to those areas already. And they, passing by Mycenae, came down to Troas. Troas isn't shown on this map, but it is down by the coast, the other side of Mycenae there. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So I think he's gotten his message conversion of Lydia and after he had been, had seen the vision immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia remember it's Luke who wrote the book of Acts and all of a sudden it's saying we endeavored to go into Macedonia instead of they assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to for to preach the gospel to them Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came to a straight course to uh, Samothracia and to the next Neapolis. Samothrace is an island somewhere in between here in Philippi in this area here. That's Macedonia up there in the area that they're running to or the, the area that they're going to is an island at the halfway point. Neapolis is the seaport just a few miles from Philippi, you see there at the top. And from there to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, a Roman colony. I think your Bible just simply says it's a colony, but it is a Roman colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. The we is Luke, who has now joined Paul's party which now consists of Silas, Timothy, and perhaps others in Troas is where they met up with them before going over to Philippi. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer worship was allowed to be made. And we sat down and spoke to the women which resorted there or gathered at that point. And a certain woman named Lydia a seller of purple, here meaning purple cloth, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard whose heart the Lord had opened. Remember, it's God. He's the only one that knows everybody's heart. He's the only one that searches the hearts and reins of every individual, and he knows when they're ready, and that's when he pulls them. And that's what this means, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended and gave attention to the things which were spoken by Paul. This is the same Paul, a former Pharisee, remember this is Paul, 
a former Pharisee that is preaching to an audience of women. This reveals much about his changed attitude since the Pharisees, which he was, commonly thanked God that they were not Gentile slaves or women. Something to be thanking God for, huh? During the Roman period, laws restricted who could wear clothes dyed in purple because it was deemed the most precious of all colors. Thus, Lydia undoubtedly dealt with an exclusive and affluent clientele. It had not been the right time for Paul to evangelize Asia, but God brought a woman who lived there to him in Macedonia. Remember, she lived in Thyatira. And when she was baptized, they just jumped right to it. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought, in other words, gave invitations saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into, the ha into my house and abide. And she constrained, she compelled them, she twisted the arm. She said, if, if I'm right by God, then you come and stay at my house. Some lady there. So anyway, they they stayed. They acted like they were not really willing to at the time, but they still stayed. Lydia offered her home to Paul and his companions as their headquarters while they remained in Philippi. This was a common practice in the Roman world, especially among Christians, since public housing facilities were few and most unpleasant. And it came to pass, as he, we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Soothsaying means to utter spells under the guise of prophesying. She acts like she's prophesying over you, but she's casting the spell. That's what they do through divination. They still do that today. The same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show us the way of salvation. The title most high God had meaning for the Greeks, Romans and Jews. All of these groups had passing interest in some way or another, not the way of salvation. The Greeks called Zeus the most high God, so anybody else being called the most high God would insult them. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. We can only speculate as to why Paul was now led to cast out the demon. She had been with him many days. What she said was true. But Paul knew better than accept the, the testimony of a demon. Immediately she was freed from this dreadful bondage over her mind and body. However, when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Being Jews during that time in Roman areas made them the object already of dislike, contempt, and suspicion by the Romans. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to, to receive, neither to observe being Romans. But the whole charge, of course, is pure hip hypocrisy, these men would have let the missionaries preach what religion they pleased if they had not dried up their source of gain, if they had not dried up their money source, their, their earnings. So they conceal the real cause of their rage under the guise of zeal for religion, law, and good order. And the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Notice no trial. This is mob rule. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. 
not for the security of the prisoners, but meaning to keep them securely. They weren't worried about the safety of the prisoners. They were worried about the safety of the guard if he lost them. Who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. In other words, they were put into the area where there was no light and made their feet fast in the stocks. In this passage, we see two of Satan's chief methods. First, he tried false friendship, the testimony of the demon-possessed girl. When this failed, he resorted to open persecution. It's either alliance or persecution. These are the alternatives, false friendship or open war. I prefer open war. Philippian jail converted, jailer converted. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. And the prisoners heard them. And what it means by heard, they were listening. And suddenly, suddenly, another one of these suddenlies, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the, foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. I can assure you the bands falling off had nothing to do with the earthquake. And the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Remember, all security personnel under Romans, if you lose your prisoner, you die. Plain and simple. Of course, with all the prison doors open, that means everybody gone. He might as well just take care of it himself. That's all he, you know, he's, he knew his life was forfeit. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Amen. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved and your household. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. Remember that immediate thing. Once they converted, they got baptized. And he and all his straightway. In other words, all in his household, even if there were any servants, all within the household back then, if you were a servant, you belonged to that household, you also got baptized if you believed. And usually when the master believed, that's when everybody else said, okay, that's where we're going. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat a meal before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent sergeants, and the word for sergeants here literally means rod holders. Remember when it talks about Jesus Christ, when he comes back, he's going to rule with an iron rod. That means that these are the people that were in charge. These were the people that brought the prisoners to the jails, to the jailers, or whatever. These were the uh, constables saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly in public, uncondemned, with no trial. Being Romans, oops, I bet they forgot to ask that and have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out secretly? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. They had been tried and beaten unfairly. Now the magistrates think they would sink, slink away as if guilty and in disgrace. No, let the magistrates come and release the prisoners. The Roman government guaranteed its citizens a public trial and freedom from degrading punishments such as beatings. And the sergeants told these words to the magistrates, and they feared, and rightfully so, they messed up. When they heard that they were Romans, and they came and besought, fetched them, and brought out, and desired to depart out of the city. 
Roman officials charged with mistreating Roman citizens faced the danger of discipline by their superiors. These magistrates meekly appeared to Paul and Silas not to file a complaint. They still wanted them to leave Philippi since popular opinion was still hostile to them. And they went out of the prison and entered or came to Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they comforted them. In other words, you know, they, they'd been beaten, spent the night in jail. But they came and comforted them, letting, letting them know everything's okay. Everything is still in God's hands. And then they departed. Paul did not leave Philippi immediately. First, he encouraged the Christians. This group forms the nucleus of the church in Philippi that forever after is a source of joy to Paul and a source of encouragement to other believers because Paul writes about them in his letters to some of the other churches and believers. Now we have Paul and Silas. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Luke evidently stayed in Philippi, since he again now is describing Paul's party as they instead of we. So now Luke has separated from the party. And Paul, as is his manner, went into them, and three Sabbath days, in other words, he stayed three weeks, reasoning with them out of the scriptures. Opening and alleging, alleging means to, to compare the word as far as Jesus Christ to the Old Testament, that Christ must needs, it was necessary for him to have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach to you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted or associated with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. In other words, a great multitude of the Greeks now are coming with them. And of the chief women, not a few. In other words, many of them as well. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with jealousy, with envy, took to them certain lewd, and the lewd, uh, the word used for lewd here means men that were malicious and violent fellows of the baser sort. Vulgar lowlifes is exactly what that word means. And gathered a company. They raised a mob and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. The Jews treat Paul and Silas harshly here as they had in Galatia because they are again jealous of the popularity and effectiveness of his message. Jason is evidently their host in Thessalonica as Lydia had been in Philippi. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain of the brothers to the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come here also. This shows the radical power of the faith. It changed the world and is continuing to change people in the world and all throughout the world. And what they didn't understand is in a backhanded way they were given a compliment. Whom Jason has received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. They are charging Paul and Silas with the crime of treason against the Romans. Here again, the Jews are denying God and claiming Caesar. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. In other words, they find them, they, get, they had to put up a bond of a sort. That's what it means by the security of Jason. When they had paid the required amount of money, a bond that they would keep the peace. And the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas by night to Berea, who coming went into the synagogue of the Jews. Paul don't mess around. He, he, he comes into the next village, he goes right into the synagogue, he's, he's right there for the next one. Paul did leave town and wrote later to the Thessalonians that Satan had hindered his return. He talked about that in 1 Thessalonians. His inability to return was the result of this tactic of his enemies. 
The Christians, however, carried on admir admirably for which Paul thanked God profusely. These were more noble, talking about the men of the synagogue here in Berea, the Bereans. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. And when it, mean, when it says not a few, that means it was a bond. It was a huge number. Their example of daily Bible study has inspired Christians ever since to do the same. Anyone who listens to, the new religious tr to any new religious truth would do well to compare it with scripture as these Jews did. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge, you know, the guys in the next village over, they're all riled up, you know, they chased them out of their town, but that wasn't good enough, and that's the way it is. You'd think that they'd leave them alone, but no, they come to the next village where they are. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the people. The peace breakers came to accuse the peaceful again. And then immediately the brothers sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timothy as Timothy abode there still. And they that conducted or led Paul brought him to Athens. In other words, a security detail this time had to take him. They conducted him and brought him to Athens. And receiving a commandment to Silas and Timothy for to come, for to, come to him with all speed, they departed. In other words, now that Paul has been safely brought to Athens, he sends for his traveling companions. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred inside him when he saw the city wholly given over to idolatry. In other words, it disturbed his spirit with all of the false idols and the false religions that were in this city. Remember, Athens is the, the central portion of all of the philosophers. Athens, and these are, I put this up here, these are all the Greek gods and different gods that they worshiped. Athens is still the cultural and intellectual center of the Greek world. Paul observes many of the temples and statues that still stand there today. Some fool themselves into believing these objects are only of interest for their artistic value now. But in Paul's day as it is today, they are still idols and places of worship that the Greeks and others regard as holy. Therefore, disputed, in other words, he preached and reasoned he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. The Agora market was the center of civic life in Athens. There the philosophers gathered to discuss and debate their views. It lay to the west of the Acropolis on which the Pantheon still stands and Mars Hill. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Well, what babbler means in the way that they were using it refers to someone who picks up words of others as a bird picks up seeds. Paul's hearers, the ones that were listening, are implying that he put together a philosophy of life simply by picking up this and that scrap of an idea from various sources. But others, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Right now he's in Athens, where in Athens it's ruled by a board or a council. Epicureans, this will sound familiar to you. Epicureans are disciples of Epicurus from 341 to 270 BC, who believe that pleasure is the greatest good and the most worthy pursuit of man. They mean pleasure in the sense of tranquility and freedom from pain, unsettling urges and fears, most especially the fear of death. 
Epicurus taught that the gods take no interest in human affairs. Thus organized religion is bad and the gods will not punish evildoers in the afterlife. Epicurus followers also believe that everything happens by chance, it's all happenstance, and that death is the end of everything. You go in the grave and that's it. That's what they believe. They are similar to the agnostic secularist and atheist. This philosophy is still very popular today. Stoics follow the teaching of Zeno the Cypriot. His followers place great importance on living in harmony with nature. They stress individual self-sufficiency, in other words, relying on yourself only, and rationalism. And they have a reputation for being quite arrogant. Stoics are pantheists who believe that God is in everything and everything is God. They are also fatalistic, resigned to whatever fate befalls them. Their teaching is also common today. Their philosophy of life comes from poet W.E. Henley who wrote, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. In his poem, Invictus, Stoics are also dreamers. And they took him and brought him to Areopagus, which is Mars Hill, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof you speak is. Hill of Ares, or Mars Hill, on which the council of the Areopagus conducted its business in ancient times. For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. The Council of Areopagus has authority over religion, morals, and education in Athens. Its members want to know what Paul is advocating. Enemies of Socrates had poisoned him for teaching strange ideas in Athens. So Paul is in some danger. This group compares to our Supreme Court. Note that Athens is the literary cap capital of the ancient world, the most cultured city and the place where Romans went to complete their education at the university where thousands came to study. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear something new. In other words, they were only interested in hearing about new things, not necessarily following them. They just, they just loved the learning but not necessarily uh, accepting any of it other than just having the knowledge of it. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Which simply means that they were firm in their reverence for their gods. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown god. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him I declare to you today. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. The true God created all things. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, human temples cannot contain him. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. In other words, men don't have to make things for him. He participates in human existence and has made of one blood all nations of men. In other words, we all descended from one ancestor. And has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. The Greeks and especially the Athenians prided themselves on being racially superior to all people. Still Paul told them that they, like all other people, had descended from one source, Adam. This fact excludes the possibility of the essential superiority of any race. God also determines the times of nations and their seasons, which means he determines when they rise and fall and what their boundaries and borders are. In other words, God is sovereign over the political and military affairs of nations. The Greeks like to think that they determined their own destiny. 
that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after or search for him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, because that saying up there, for in him we live and move and have our being, was quoting one of their Greek poets. Have said, for we are also his offspring, because he was using it in reference to God. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we are the children of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like to gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's thoughts. And the time of this ignorant God that winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Before Christ came into the world, the Gentiles had no revelation from God, and the, Jew, the Jews had only an imperfect one. Since Christ has come, God's final and complete truth has been given to mankind. Question? Yes. <clears throat> what does it mean? Can you go back here for a second? What does it mean God and Jesus had only an imperfect one? What, what does that mean? Well, remember when Jesus came that they were worshiping according to what the rabbis had written, not God's word? They were very imperfect in all their understandings. That's what he's talking about. But the Gentiles had absolutely nothing. We didn't have, you know, the word of God other than those that went and converted to Judaism. Then they worshiped the same God. Paul's conclusion was that idolatry, therefore, is illogical. If God created people, God cannot be an image or an idol. Paul was claiming that God's divine nature is essentially spiritual rather than material. Before Jesus Christ came, God did not view guilt as he does now that Christ has come. They were guilty of failing to respond to the former revelation, but now they are more guilty in view of the greater revelation that Jesus Christ brought at his incarnation. Consequently, people's guilt is greater this side of Jesus Christ coming his incarnation. Nevertheless, they live in a time when God has revealed more of himself than previously. We live in a time when God has pretty much revealed everything to us, except those few things that he said, shut up, that's not going to be for right now. This makes it all the more important that Christians take the gospel to everyone. Greater revelation by God means greater responsibility for the people, both for the unsaved and the saved. God previously took the relative lack of understanding about himself into consideration as he dealt with people. Now that Christ has come, he will hold people responsible for their sins. Because he has appointed, appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Jesus Christ, by that man whom he has ordained. Wherefore, he has given assurance to all men in that he raised Jesus from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear you again of this matter. Because these are Greeks, remember, and all they are interested in is learning and hearing more new things, they like to hear new things. They weren't too really interested in saying, okay, well, I'm going to take your Jesus. Now, there's some that did. Paul's speech presented the greatness of God, he is the creator. The goodness of God, he is provider. The government of God, he is ruler. And the grace of God, he is savior. So Paul departed from among them. However, certain men clave or stuck with him and believed. Among them was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. The response to Paul's preaching is typical. Some mocked, others procrastinated, and a few believed. Among the believers is Dionysius, a mem member of the council of Areopagus, that had examined Paul and the merits of woman whom we really know nothing more about because nothing more is written. To the Philippian jailer, Paul had preached Christ 
as the personal savior of individuals, talking about the one that fell down, you know, after the earthquake. To the Jews in Thessalonica, he presented him as the promised Messiah. To the intellectual Gentiles in the Athens, he proclaimed him as the proven judge of all humankind appointed by the one true God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wow. Covered a lot of ground, but really not too much. Do we have any questions over what we did cover? As long as you're able to follow along and you're all keeping up with it, which I believe most all of you are, that is not a problem because, I, like I said, I can continue to see the growth in all of you and your zeal for God increasing more and more that you're going out and talking to the people and bringing them into the church. Amen. That's the purpose of all of it. All right. Well, if there are no questions or comments, no comments either, then we shall take communion.